Good morning. Um, my name is Fariba Faru. I've been the program manager for this portfolio, Dynamics and Control, for the last uh, two and a half years. But uh, in addition to the other program that I have, computational math, one of the things you're going to um, hear in the actually two talks, and also the talk by uh, Don Hearn, Dr. Hearn, uh, on optimization, is that uh, there are lots of areas that overlap in these uh, portfolios. And you're going to see that. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I, when I was preparing the talks for the two very different programs, I realized there's a lot of overlap uh, between them. Um, so, let me. Oh, there's a. Oh. This one? Yeah. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> so this is a portfolio. This is a program that uh, deals with the uh, development of mathematical theory and algorithms. Um, that is going to be basically is an interplay of dynamical system and control. Basically, it's in some ways the gold of these uh, this portfolio is really lofty because you, you can use these ideas for design, for analysis, design, and control of almost any Air Force system. So, uh, so th this is this is a lofty goal, but um, in fact the the the, the uh, research area is rich enough to handle some uh, um, the uh, challenging tasks that it's given. What is important is that more than uh, ever, basically, I mean, what happens is that when some theories develop and they become basically commonplace, everybody uses them, then there is more demand on them. In this case, we are lo uh, looking at operation of uh, the system in uncertain, complex, and adversarial environment. And each of these elements actually add to the complexity of our uh, challenge, uh, the challenges that we are facing. Um, you're supposed to list our sub-areas in portfolio. I had a little bit of back and forth about how to put it in. But basically, I can say that um, one of those portfolios that we all look at, that we, hand, we, we look at applications that are of in, uh, importance to the Air Force. But in addition to that, we, I actually do support uh, development of basic theory in control and also dynamical system. And I think that's, that's an important point to make. Um, so we're looking at uh, the basically going to some hard problems uh, that are still unsolved in optimal control, adaptive control, uh, stochastic, and hybrid. Um, I will describe some of these basically to tell you that these are not just jargons I'm using so you can see what, what I mean by each of these terms. But more than ever, the, um, the unifying theme in the portfolio is really uh, basically dealing with multi-agent system. In this case, it would be distributed multi-agent control. So things such as path planning, decision making, sensing, task allocation with adversarial and stochastic elements is something that we are uh, focusing on. But this focus does not mean that's the only thing I do. For example, I think this, uh, as you can see, uh, this emerging application, quantum control and vision-based control, I'm going to give you examples on these, that in what way these particular application areas actually are adding to the theory. They actually end up needing new paradigm for control theory. Um, these are at very important areas, VNV of embedded system, mixed human machine interface, and control of distributed parameter system. These two specifically, since two, actually 2005, I mean, so it's been a while ago, we have had, uh, we've been actually pioneered uh, in some ways uh, the uh, research in this area. Um, and we had MIRIs, we did this through our MIRIs, but they have not, uh, they're ending. This one is in 2006 and this one was in 2007, so it's ending. So one of the bigger challenges for us is uh, to see um, how we can uh, com uh, continue the research that's been uh, supported through these MIRIs through uh, um, uh, future initiatives. Um, so here I have to uh, definitely um, uh, talk about the Take Horizon report. I remember I, I was having my program review at the time and right in the middle of it, this, uh, the Take Horizon report actually uh, um, came online and everybody in the portfolio, uh, everybody in the review, hey, look at this, look at this, look how important you are as a, as a, as a field to basically Air Force mission. And it is true. If you look at the key te uh, technology areas here, these are the areas that are actually uh, common to uh, quite a few of the uh, 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 areas that were uh, 
<coughs> that, was, that were deemed important, like for example, autonomous system, autonomous reasoning and learning, resilient autonomy, collaborative, cooperative control, all these areas that are areas that dynamics and control um, addresses. Um, and all of them are important. Two of the grand challenges exactly at the heart of this portfolio, for example, trusted, highly autonomous decision-making system and fractionated comp uh, composable uh, survival autonomous system. So here I may say that yes, dynamics and control in this case it has a central um, position to handle these issues in autonomous, uh, for science of autonomy. But the point I also want to make is that it's not the only one, only program. You're going to see uh, in the past we have um, uh, uh, collaborated, but I think it's just going to be more than that, that we just collaborate, we talk. There's going to be more than that. With pro uh, programs, for example, of robust decision making and cognitive science is essential to the goals of autonomy. Uh, optimization portfolio is, is essential. For some of these, the methodologies that are coming from complex networks, it's important, it's essential. It's not, you can't just uh, ignore all of it. Uh, anyway. And uh, so you see that uh, in order to uh, continue and uh, in some ways maybe be the leader in support of uh, uh, science of autonomy, we really need to have a more um, uh, encompassing uh, view and a collaborative view on, uh, on this research. I'm going to be using distributor control for network system as sort of the unifying thing for the talk. Um, so in this case, just to tell you, because I, I know that sometimes people ask me, you, you, you tell about all these wonderful things that are happening in your portfolio, all success stories, so what is the challenge here? So I wanted to put this here. So what are the challenges in distributed control here? So in this case, you are, these are the, these are, uh, these are the uh, issues. We are dealing with decentralization, uh, uh, localization of objectives, lossy communication. You have agents, right, that are, uh, that are communicating, and sometimes com I mean you have lossy or uh, information uh, communication, which will lead to uh, incompleteness of information. Actually, this, uh, we've been talking uh, in some context, talking about trust or talking about uh, deception. These are issues that can happen here. Adversarial interference, for example, that's part of it. And a lot of times you're looking at multiplicity of objectives. You're not just, not all agents are trying to they have the same objectives. Sometimes they have different objectives and they can be in some ways contradictory to each other. So there should be, and, and solving all these problems is going to be very difficult. So these are as far as the challenges. What I have in blue here is the, the stuff that I like to talk about. Okay, so for autonomous dynamic mission planning, and I'm just trying to say in what way this, uh, the projects that I'm supporting trying to address the uh, challenge. By no means I'm saying this is the only way to do it. This is just at least to say that, okay, <laughs> there are ways of handling some of these challenges. For autonomous dynamic mission planning, hybrid system formulation is one way of doing this. I'll, I'll talk about this in the next slide. In this case, you're looking at mix of finite discrete state, uh, in this case, there could be the decision variable, and, you could, uh, and you're looking at continuous dynamics here. I mean, hybrid system is something that has been in some ways implemented quite well. I mean, uh, just reading that, yeah, for example, just look at the way your um, uh, microwave, for example, works, right? I mean, you choose a particular uh, temperature setting or, uh, you know, whatever, and like so the potatoes, for example. By choosing that, then you're going to have a certain uh, 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 um, <clears throat> amount of basically... Uh, uh, that's how your system starts working. So that's what you mean by the discrete st uh, state, which is your decision variable. Um, human machine interaction and operation. There are lots of different ideas here, but I have to say this is something that requires a lot more. Um, uh, I, I think we need to look at this a lot more, uh, a lot more because. You have heard that different portfolios are looking at this. This is uh, considered as one of the biggest challenges for the science of autonomy and actually the Air Force. Uh, we have a mo uh, multi-service um, working group on autonomy. And this is something that the Air Force has been tasked with. And I'm not satisfied with the, uh, the methodologies that are right now out there. It's either just focusing on the human part or it's just focusing on the machine part, which is, I have to say, is mostly something that the control theorists do. And I still don't see a good way of putting human-machine uh, together. 
in the, in the, for the challenge of incorporation of uncertainty in mission uh, environment, I have talked in the past about uh, uh, methodologies that have been developed in the portfolio by support of uh, my program. Uh, for example, adaptive control, uh, one of them that has, I mean, I talked about it last year, L1 control theory, and also various uh, uh, formulation of stochastic control. I'm not going to be talking about it this year. Uh, this year, you're going to hear a lot about game theory. And, um, and you, so I hope uh, it's going to be a little bit challenging here, but I hope I can convince you that uh, game theoretic approaches uh, uh, can be quite fruitful in, um, in formulating uh, at least the problem to model adversarial behavior in the, uh, in the pro uh, especially when you have incomplete information uh, about your environment, about the, uh, about the uh, actions of your uh, opponent, or let's say even say the next, you know, the agent. So in this case, uh, 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 incorporation of learning uh, algorithms into game and uh, in order to do even problems such as task allocation and planning uh, is something that uh, we've been pursuing and I'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, emergent application, I hope I've talked fast enough so I can get to these very uh, interesting application. Computational issues, uh, I believe that I can just give a talk just on this. Uh, this is one of my, the areas that I believe the program is unique in its support, but talking about it in its, uh, uh, it requires a little bit more work. So that's why I said, well, I'll talk about it uh, uh, next time. But this is an area that deserves basically a whole new initiative. Okay, so I told you that hybrid control formulation is uh, one way of uh, formulating these multi-agent system and complex uh, sensing environment. So what do we mean by this uh, uh, hybrid system? As I said, so you can, for example, look at, uh, you're looking at a discrete system. You, kinda, you call it, for example, automaton. That could be uh, your decision variable. It could be something that, for example, and, and how, what do, so that's that. And then uh, what we are saying is that it's dynamics, it's evolution, right? It can be done, uh, uh, it can be modeled in a continuous way, right? So, okay, so how do we use this? So suppose you want to do a path planning for uh, this vehicle here. And the goal is, for example, for it to go from this point to here, for example, let's say, and uh, tr try to avoid this obstacle. So how do we avoid this obstacle, basically? So uh, you can do the path planning. In this case, maybe you have, um, you can actually, uh, so that's the mission objective. So you know what you're going to be doing. But the other goal is that you're going to be sensing your environment. You want to definitely uh, avoid this obstacle, OK? And of course, avoidance is, has to do with, uh, as I said, in this case, uh, some sensing. You could do vision sensing or radar or whatever. That's what they mean by in complex sensing environment here. All right. So uh, what is the thing? So, so in this case, the problem is, uh, it's actually a challenging problem. And there are lots and lots of different ways to look at it. But the idea here is that, OK, suppose you know if you want to go from here to there. But um, in this case, the, uh, the, both the path and the objective and the sensing information you have is not known for all times. All you have is just a, uh, uh, some sort of time here, basically from time t to t plus h. Okay. So in this, that's what we mean by uh, uh, sort of a receding horizon type of problem in this case, that you only have this kind of information for, uh, for uh, a certain time period. And then based on that, can you come up with the uh, optimal way of going from here to there, avoiding this obstacle? This, as I said, this is actually not an easy problem. Um, so, um, and of course, once you get here, then the question, then you can, you see your horizon, for example, you can go from here to there, and depending on, and you can make this kind of decision. So solving this problem in a, in a computationally efficient way has been actually one of the open problems here. And one of the things that uh, my PI at uh, uh, Illinois, uh, Gear Dollarud, has done is that he has looked at this problem, has found out that this hybrid uh, problem, uh, if you look at the special class of it, so. In this case, you're looking at the linear uh, system. You have linear dynamics and the linear control. In this case, you have this observation, which is also linear. Um, you can actually get the solution to this problem exactly. As I said, computation, these problems are very difficult. So if you can actually find an exact solution, that's quite a bit of an advancement here. 
And he's been able to do that, that for certain type of uh, problem, you can, uh, um, depending on what, I mean, you, you can also look at different cost function. For example, in this case, you're looking at maximum gain. So you're looking at the maximum gain, in this case, your output versus your uh, uh, input here, or you look at a stochastic way, windowed uh, variance. And he's been able to solve this problem and found out this, this is actually, uh, you can reduce it to a convex programming problem. Uh, Dr. Hearn probably is, will say, yes, exactly. So what happens actually in optimal control problem is that after doing a lot of work, you turn the problem to some optimization problem. So in this case, you have a, a convex programming. And um, there are lots of lots of uh, algorithms right now uh, that are very, very good in solving this complex pro programming problem. And you can get the solution to this. And now the, the, the goal is that, well, can you now take this, uh, uh, can you extend these results to problems of importance? For example, we always want to look at the nonlinear version of this, which is going to be, uh, so there's, gonna, there's not going to be a, ever an exact solution to it, but at least you can look at solution to that using ideas such as uh, dynamic programming. Okay. Ooh. Doesn't like to. But. Is there a big picture? Hmm? Yeah. Can you? Uh, is it dead? What is it? Ah, okay. Now. We are getting now to this point of, so this is game theoretic approaches, okay. Because right now we're gonna be looking at interacting agents in adversarial environment. By the way, one of the things about the hybrid control, I, sh I should say is that, so that was just for one agent. Imagine you're trying to now uh, uh, <coughs> um, extend those results to multi-agent trying to do that and see that the complexity of problem definitely increases. But so in this case, this is a my mirror. This is mirror 2010, and uh, it was the first mirrored topic uh, in its kind. And it was really good to see that uh, ARO uh, continued research uh, in this area the following year. Uh, in uh, uh, basically a mirror just, that just just deals with uh, game theoretic approaches, and uh, they have selected a team that's really doing a fantastic job here. So a lot of the work right now in these different MURIs and big projects among the different uh, uh, agencies are complementary, and that is really, really uh, good to see. And I'm sure that this kind of uh, cooperation and collaboration is going to uh, increase in the future. We are talking to each other about how we can write complementary topics. Um, but what is really hard about this particular problem, when I, you know, when I first was looking at this, I was, oh my God, how are people going to be looking at this uh, a problem? Because not only we're looking at game theory, but we are also looking at, in some ways, uh, uh, we're, so the ultimate goal in this case, when you look, we're talking about agents, it would be human and machine, right? I mean, the agent, we're not just talking about uh, uh, just machines here. And so we're talking mm -hmm. about humans in the loop. And then we are looking at basic network. Right now, we're not, I mean, so the scale of the problem is going to be very challenging, and dealing with all of that is going to be a major challenge here. So um, in this case, it's, so this team actually has a very interesting approach. And that is that really for a realistic situation, you are going to have different levels here. And each of these levels are different networks. And these networks are going to be interacting with each other. These are the, basically the network of the basically the agents that where all the decision making is going to be made. In this case, this is sort of the information layer here, right? And this is the physical uh, layer, where you have all the basic uh, physical portion of your uh, network is going to be uh, involved. So this is going to be basically uh, responsive to both the two and one. And this is going to be, uh, be controlled by this one. So you see that, you, and, and most of the time, the games is going to be happening. Basically, it's going to be multi-resolution. You're going to be uh, uh, going to all these different levels. And that's really, really hard. So, so let me tell you a little bit about, uh, so when I asked them to send me slides about their achievement, they sent me like 20 slides. I said, no, this is no way I can talk about any of this. So I started to actually go a little bit uh, easy on myself also and on the, my audience. So basically, what is this? That, uh, what is, what is basically the idea of the game theory here? The traditional model of decision making is this. So you have a system that is controlled by many agents. Each agent is going to have its own objective. 
The question is that whether we're going to have an equilibrium or optimal solution. So you have these, as I said, you have these agents that are interacting. And in this case, the decision making is going to be dependent on the decision making of the other agents, right? So uh, and for game theory, there is a notion of, of course, uh, we all know about the Nash equilibrium. Uh, but the notion of Nash equilibrium only exists or certain assumptions are made. That in this case, the, the, the game or team parameters for the system, action, rewards, all of that are going to be known to everybody, right? And that's not the case in realistic system uh, situation. Computational power is unlimited. You're going to see that's not at all the case. I mean, the situation that I just explained. And also, information is not faulty. So that's, again, that's not a situation. So the question is that what happens if just one or some or all of these assumptions do not hold? Then what happens? So one way to deal with some of this is that, uh, this is to uh, put um, or insert these uh, learning algorithms here. So the whole idea of uh, a learning algorithm is that, that uh, you start out with certain, so in this case, you have no larger, uh, knowledge of your payoff function or payoff function of your adversary or the action spaces, you don't have, so, but you try to learn that while you play your game, okay? And one of the nice results that they've been able to get in just for the two-person security game, that for the non-zero-sum stochastic game um, with unknown state, if you uh, apply this uh, learning algorithm, you can actually get a state-independent Nash equilibrium. So you actually would know what the outcome of this is. So this is an interesting and very important result that they've been able to uh, get. Now, in addition to this uh, mirror team that I have, I also have a smaller team uh, that look at some of these ideas, uh, slightly different uh, point of view. Uh, uh, so one of the work uh, here is attack and defense of the network. You see that, for example, this problem area is definitely related, for example, to um, for example, security, and, and also a lot of these ideas also have been studied uh, in the, again, in the computation, uh, I'm sorry, in the optimization and operation research community. So again, to tell you that uh, how related these portfolios are. And in fact, uh, David Castanon has been a PI both for my program and also for Dr. Hearns. So here, what are we looking at? The games that distributed a tracker with partial information attack an intelligent network. And so, uh, but you have limited information. So in this case, you may have the kind of attack that you can have, it could be hard. In this case, maybe, maybe some of these nodes, the components could be uh, gone or destroyed or soft, meaning you will have information uh, corruption. For example, in this case, I mean, what you have here is actually the situation, this is a, what the max flow is. This is a defender. You want to maximize flow of information from point S to T. Uh, but uh, what will happen is that the, the attacker will try to, uh, in this case, this is a sort of like a trying to, this is like a min cut type of uh, thing, try to uh, attack so that uh, we'll see what the effect of is on, on the flow of information here. So prior work on this, uh, and remember one of the things is that you have to look at this uh, problem in the stochastic sense um, because, uh, uh, so, so, so there is some probability uh, for, for the uh, information flow, right? I mean, it's not, it's not a, uh, it's not a um, uh, deterministic case. So prior work on stochastic network interdiction, actually, uh, Kevin Wood from NPS has been one of the pioneers in this work, and there are other people also in this area. Again, uh, there are some of the PIs in Dr. Hearn's uh, portfolio. Um, they have looked at this and basically formulated this as a, a Stackelberg game. And basically, in this case, what we my Stackelberger is a sort of a leader follower type of uh, uh, game. And uh, they have offered solution to uh, this problem. But again, what happens when your problem is this complicated? And in this case, for example, the solution space is so large, you have to come up with ways of basically by pruning a solution space so that you can come up with something. A, a lot of times the problem that uh, the solution that you have is not definitely going to be optimal. So, uh, so these are the challenges here. The approach is, is that approximate game analysis in all of these whenever you don't, you can get the, the the exact solution you try to uh, find, uh, use approximation and get uh, approximate solution. 
And uh, so for example, you can use approximate dynamic programming or minimax performance uh, where network reacts to attacks. So that's one way. So this is, for example, one of the encouraging results that uh, uh, Professor Castillo has had. And in this case, for the single stage, is that he has looked at new performance bounds in this case uh, in order to uh, come up with a, a faster way of solving this problem. Three orders of magnifiers that previous for some may not seem like a lot, but this is definitely an improvement over what is uh, uh, right now out there. And of course now the, the goal is to have it as a two-stage stack for general networks. Um, uh, so, okay, so that's, that's the, uh, that's one, uh, one way of, uh, what was the class of uh, problems that have been now pursued in the portfolio. All right. I wanted to talk about this. I had talked about this actually about a couple of years ago. It's a very interesting way of uh, looking now at the problem of decentralized decision making, which is also again in the context of stochastic dynamic games. What I like the idea is that this whole idea of mean field, okay, mean field theory. The mean field theory is actually uh, is an intuition from st uh, statistical mechanics. Something that physicists can definitely be proud of is that a lot of times ideas from physics, uh, st uh, statistical mechanics, theoretical physics, uh, they get the rediscovered by uh, researchers in other fields and then they claim it, but then physicists can say, well, we actually had had, you know, we knew about this a long time ago. But what is nice about this is that all the games that, or, or the uh, multi-agent scenarios that we've been looking at, if you look at it, there's just like one or two, uh, we're talking about two players or maybe n players. What happens if you're talking about a large ensemble? For example, you can look at it, for example, as storms, okay? So again, it's a question of scale. What happens here when n gets really large? One of the uh, intuition here is that if you have a very large population, and in this case is a large, maybe you can use, uh, you can use, basically take the limit and start looking at the continuum limit, okay? So what, what, what let me see, what, what, let me tell you what, what this means. Um, so in this case, you have individual agent system, you have this cost function, and this cost function is gonna depend on the states of the population, okay? So you have the individual agent dynamics here, Okay, so you have some noise. Um, so yeah, and that's your control, that's your, I mean, this is your dynamics here. Now, individual cost is going to be depending on behavior, mass behavior. So it depends, whatever you're gonna be uh, um, optimizing, that's what we mean, it's going to be dependent on your own state, state of all the other agents, and of course your control. So this is like this. So every agent is going to be playing against this mass, and this mass is all the other agents. So that's what we mean by the continuum here. So the effect of all the other agents is going to be uh, looked as a basically bulk mass. And that's an interesting uh, intuition about using some of these uh, uh, ideas here. And I just put in here uh, different ways that in this case, when n gets very large, so your problem ends up being instead of, for example, on an ODE and all that basic ordinary differential, it becomes infinite dimensional. And different, this, and, and they lead to this kind of formulation in order to see what the uh, basically base, uh, best control or optimal control is going to be, whether it's hamilton jacobi equation or Fokker-Planck equation. And, and this is just basically the best response uh, uh, control here. And of course, each of these formulation, so uh, it requires a lot of analysis and theory in order to, see, uh, to, to just solve this. It's amazing, you start off with a simple problem, and, but the solution to the very simple problem ends up being very complicated. So <clears throat> that's one of the things about actually a uh, whole theory of control. Um, uh, just because something is linear or large does not mean that a solution to it is going to be uh, easy. Okay, now one of the, uh, so in this case, so as I said, so one of the nice results here is that the single agent's control, right, we are interested always in the feedback control. It's going to be a combination of two things. One is feedback of stochastic local, that's your rough solution, and then feedback of a det deterministic global which is, uh, has to do with basically the behavior of the mass here. And if you're asking yourself, well, what is this epsilon here? Well, 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 uh, the epsilon has to do with the fact that 
in this case, we are taking this limit as n goes to uh, infinity. So that's why you had that infinity thing. What happens if you just take n to be finite but it's still large? So in this case, the solution you have is not going to be necessarily uh, optimal if you solve those problems. It's going to be epsilon optimal. Basically, it's going to deviate from the optimality by some uh, quantifiable uh, epsilon. So that's where, where that is. It's a very interesting theory. It's had a lot of uh, actually buzz uh, uh, lately about it. Uh, in fact, um, uh, uh, Jean-Pierre, I guess, uh, Lyon has been working on this uh, area too because he's been uh, one of the areas, uh, he's a famous mathematician in France, applied mathematician, got the Fields Medal. And, uh, he, because he's interested in all these different type of solutions, like viscosity solution, Hampton Jacobi, so he's been using this idea. And my PI, uh, Peter Case, would say, you have to tell them I was the one who started this first, and they, they didn't, they were anywhere. Why is that? Because it's all in the area of control theory, and those guys more in the PD. And if you don't know about the work in other areas, you may not know that some of this work has been done. OK. Ha. Now it's a little bit about application. I only have nine minutes, but I really want to get through this one because this is really interesting. Um, how you can, uh, so the point of the, uh, the next uh, few slides is to say that um, my PIs are, they're not just looking at, as you can see, they are trying, either they borrow <laughs> or, or steal of the best cases uh, theory. Uh, out there in uh, mathematics, and they're trying to use it for the particular application. Uh, this is a, actually is going to be a new project, but actually Alan Tannenbaum has been working in this area for some time. And this is, an, is going to be a new project, which is optim optimal, uh, the whole theory of optimal mass transfer for signal analysis and control. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about this. The whole idea here, of, uh, these are the different applications like registration, and so the, you're looking at a lot of the application you're looking at, you're, you're trying to look at distribution, right? And uh, you want to establish different, uh, I mean, uh, correspondence between different uh, distribution. You want to do a kind of a statistical analysis. You want to, uh, for example, average. You want to interpolate. You want to uh, do registration. All of these uh, you want to be doing. So this is one very interesting area that will allow you to do that. Um, so the basic insight is this. Um, let, me, let me make sure that I say his name right, who is a French uh, engineer. Um, OK. Um, it's uh, in 1781. It's a mathematician engineer, a French engineer, uh, Gaspar uh, Monge. Uh, came up with this idea. So all he wanted to do, he wanted to transfer a, a pile of soil from one excavation site to uh, a, a pile of soil to an ex excavation site, right? So you say, well, what's the big deal here? But the goal is that he wanted to do in the least amount of work. Being an engineer, he wanted to find the optimal solution for it, not just solve the problem. And this is what it led to this very interesting idea. So in this case, uh, the whole theory of optimal transport has come up. Uh, here and by the way, I have to say, I uh, sorry about this. I, uh, miss, I mean, this is a typo here. It's Leonid uh, Kantronovich. Okay, he received the Nobel Prize actually in 1975 uh, for his work in optimal transfer in conditions resource allocation. So this uh, optimal transfer problem has been very interesting. So different application of it. Um, for example, here for the case of distributed sensor, actually, so you see that it has a, uh, the work based on this is. Um, applied in something you know that you think maybe is more applied like for example um, in this case you're looking at high resolution uh, uh, spectra and how do you how do you get that in this case you have distributed sensor array you get the, all these the different basically uh, signals here and how do you put it all together in this uh, uh, using the interpolation interpolation in this case can be done using these uh, optimal transport geodesics uh, another thing that can be used in, in the idea of uh, nonlinear filtering, and uh, as I said, so one of the things about this optimal trans mass transport is that it creates a, basically an a interesting mapping between these different sets of, we can say, sets of data. In this case, for uh, so uh, one thing about uh, the whole thing about on center Kalman filter um, is that uh, 
By the way, if you're wondering what this whole thing is, a Kalman filter basically is, as you know, is an optimal way of uh, uh, um, basically estimating the state of a, a system uh, with noisy uh, um, uh, observations. But it's optimal if your system is uh, uh, linear. So for cases of interest, which is nonlinear, then there have been extension of this, for example, like something called extended Kalman filter and then something called uh, uncertain Kalman filter. And the whole idea uh, is that, uh, uh, so you would choose in this case, uh, you would select these sigma points here and then you would map them and then you would try and you do the mapping in such a way that you can find the, uh, uh, basically the, the mean and the, for example, the covariance of your state uh, from that mapping. So cho the choice of these sigma points and how you ch decide on the mapping is what, uh, uh, you know, the success of your uncentered Kalman filter is uh, going to be dependent on. So the goal here is to use the idea of this optimal transform mapping, try to, come, uh, to map. In this case, uh, you will use your Gaussian uh, particles and try to map them uh, in order to uh, uh, use them for, uh, doing this kind of uh, statistical reconstruction of your state. So this is one way. I'm very intrigued. I like to see more work in this because, I mean, there's still a lot of work to be done in the area of filtering, nonlinear filtering. And of course, if this is going to give you better solutions, that's wonderful. But of course, the, the, it, one of the biggest issues uh, is uh, whether we can, um, uh, oh, whether computation is going to be reasonable or not. OK. now. I'm quickly running out of time. I have a lot of things to tell you. But let me tell you, this is a very good story here. I talked about it a little bit last year. This is a different way of, this is my res response on my PIs to all the stuff that you hear about compressive sensing. In this case, the idea is to extract, uh, uh, instead of uh, extracting sparse, uh, uh, your signal from sparse observation, you're trying to get information out of it, or let's say sparse information from your uh, data here. It's because in, we are talking about, in this case, dynamical system. So what we are looking at is that even though you may have a lot of data, not all of the data is going to be of importance to us. So how do you choose the data that is going to be what they call actionable information here? So the problem, what is nice is that you can use these ideas in dynamic uh, system identification system that the problem is you can reduce it to ident identifying these hybrid models that are not described by these sparse graphs, okay? And then uh, the problem becomes that you uh, combine these dynamical system ideas, optimization and all that in order to extract your idea. So uh, let's, let's, uh, these are our success stories, okay, all right. So in this case, <laughs> here, the whole idea is that you want this to be tracking actually the face. So as you see, that in this case, the task is not to figure out what, you know, tracking the whole thing, it's just tracking the face. And uh, this, uh, this, is, this can be done uh, on your laptop, basically. So this is really an interesting. Uh, <laughs> okay. So let's go to the next thing because I'm running out of time. Okay. And in this case, this is also a neat story here. Um, so in this case, you have a complex scenario. You want to figure out what's really going on here. So the whole goal becomes co you're trying to co uh, find correlation in this complex scenario. So in this case, uh, um, so you can look at it basically as a sparse graph. And, uh, and, and the, the edges of the graph are going to be determined by basically the, the, uh, the, the, the correlation of these agents here. Can you do it again? Okay. So this way, actually, based on this simple theory, you can kind of figure out that what, uh, what here is uh, happening. Okay. As I said, it goes back to compressive information extraction. Not all the data out there, and all, not all the scenarios are going to be of importance to us. You have to kind of decide what is the uh, sparse information. Okay. One minute to talk about something that I actually would like to use as maybe the basis for a future uh, work. Quantum control. Uh, this is actually something that um, the program started about two or three years ago. Matt James and Ian Peterson are two premier 
ma uh, actually mathematicians in Australia. So these are part of my uh, AORD activities here. And they have had, they're also, the, the background is in stochastic control. One of the things is that, so here there are people that have worked in stochastic control uh, for a long time. They try to use these techniques to, uh, to a quantum system, and they find that the theory fails. That if they start, for example, uh, the quantum, let's say quantum linear system that you initialize in separable Gaussian state, the theory does not uh, lead to entanglement. So this is that they find out, ah, maybe something is really uh, wrong with the way we are looking at things. And we need new paradigms in this case for quantum stochastic. Uh, the, uh, Dr. Harry Chang from ARO actually has a whole mirror now on, on uh, quantum control. Um, and you say that, well, maybe that's all we need at this point. But I really think we need to look at uh, the different issues here and look at it. Because in this case, the paradigm goes from you need different probability even models or different stochastic calculus in order to handle this. So I'm really hoping that uh, we can extend the, uh, the work here um, uh, through uh, future initiatives. OK. Um, this is really my summary slide. Uh, what probably I have not been talking about, but even though I've been mentioning it, is that we have very close uh, uh, collaboration with other funding agencies, ONR, ARO, NSF. I've been on the, uh, the review board for uh, Science of Autonomy for ONR and uh, been talking to everyone from NSF, whether engineering or uh, mathematics, uh, different uh, collaboration, uh, different uh, areas in control and dynamics. And uh, so that's my, that's it. I've already run out of time. Okay, let's thank the speaker. Okay, ready for questions. Uh, Fariba, a, a lot of really interesting work. What I'm wondering is, that most of the things you've described have been important research areas and topics as opposed to a really hard single problem. So I was wondering, we've talked in the last couple of days in some programs about grand challenges. I mean, Jamie Young gave one that was really easy to understand but incredibly hard in uh, figuring out the neural code. Um, as, as you think about the field right now, and suppose Tom Russell handed you $5 million and say you can make a prize for someone to solve this compelling, incredibly hard problem. Is there one that stands out to you as you've seen this that, that you would say is oh, a single incredible problem? All of these. For example, one uh -oh. thing. <laughs> no, 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 that's no. not fair. <laughs> no, but, but I tell you what it is. I tell you, I mean, I, I think you, you see that. Uh, for example, in, in, you know, I'm talking about game theory, right? So this is something that has been around for a long time. But here we see that uh, you can't really use it maybe as a, as a framework. It's uh, the whole question of whether it, uh, it's, it's a framework that can handle all the complexity that we are bringing in, okay? For example, uh, uh, faulty information or incomplete information or the fact, you know, with all the issues such as stochasticity, not knowing. So all these, I mean, that can be, for example, one grand, uh, grand challenge problem. But let's make it more specific to control. For example, one of the issues, one of the biggest deal about control and, and power of control theory is feedback control, right? But, and you hear it a lot. But suppose you want to actually have an optimal feedback control, right? You want to find the feedback that will really, that it's optimal, right? Well, one of the things that, that's why I think that uh, computational control theory, that's like major grand challenge here. What happens for that problem is that even if you have a linear system, right, I mean, um, if you want to solve this problem, right, the feedback portion of it, except, you know, it's for a specific problem, ends up being solution to that hamilton jacobi bellman equation. I mean, I had, I had it there just because I wanted to say, okay. And that's a very difficult problem to solve. And I have quite a few, uh, some of the best minds, whether it's computation or control, working on that part. That's really one major grand challenge problem. Okay, I think we'll have to move on because we ran out of time. In fact, we're over time. And that's one simple aspect. You think Nick, feedback you have a quick control? One? Sure. Who, who are you collaborating with in the laboratories on these problems? 
Oh, I mean, well. So, so this is a very rich body of activities. So in all of these, I'm closely relate, uh, working with. Uh, Repeat your question. Yes, she wanted to know who her program is collaborating with in the laboratory on these problems. Uh, the control uh, center uh, in RB, almost um, um, all these problems that I, I put there, the aspects of problems that they themselves in their basic research are looking at. Uh, in uh, RV uh, space, a lot of these problems, for example, game theoretic yeah. ideas, this is something that in the context of space applications is very important. And uh, there's some problems, for example, with beam control, I mean, that, that's more like an application area in RD. Uh, RW, oh, I mean, they just came to us and, uh, <laughs> and all, again, all of these uh, are aspects are, and they're uh, very, um, very much, uh, <laughs> In, you know, uh, in tune with what their needs are, and we talk uh, quite about. I have quite a few lab tests, yeah, actually. 